Uh, the first one I say, from my understanding, the essential problems with epistemology derive from the nature of language and axioms upon which various underlying linguistic structures are based and then afterwards interpreted. As you have said in your videos, the probability that you construe some of the same definitions of insert random word person says and in the same way are virtually zero. One of the best examples I can give for this is the language that is used in physics. It is widely misconstrued as the pragmatic meanings behind words in their context or worlds debased from the vague linguistic constructed views of the actual linguistic uh, definitions that people construe. So such is the problem with the word dimension, dimension in which it is understood in a more semantic sense, but not in the abstract sense in which the word is implied. The first chapter of Einstein's theory of special and general relativity, Einstein stresses that geometry is an abstract model. Time per se is not a dimension. The theory of special relativity merely treats any one clock time as dimension of an abstract construct. So for the next three questions I have, I want this to be considered as a means of Okay, so, so my answer to that fundamentally, I think the best answer to that was provided by the American pragmatists, so that would be William James and his crew. Um, that would include a guy named per Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E, -E, um, who is perhaps the, United, the best philosopher the Amer that, that the U.S. ever produced, C.S. Pierce, but who's somewhat underappreciated and was, was certainly so in his own life. Part of the way that different people hone in on the same definition is to define what an acceptable outcome would be to their joint interactions and then to hone their language until they achieve that outcome and then to consider that good enough. And see, Pierce and his crew basically said that you could never do anything better than that. So let's say that we're trying to, let's say we're trying to communicate about how we're going to move a wheelbarrow full of bricks from one side of the yard to the other. Well, basically what we've decided is we've communicated good enough if the bricks get moved. And so, so what you have to do is you have to set up a, a practical surround in some sense around your conversation and that that practical surround constitutes what you are willing to consider as proof that conversation or that communication has taken place sufficiently. I mean, that's partly, it's complicated. It's partly why the robotics engineers types like Rodney Brooks mm -hmm. discovered back in the 1980s that you really couldn't have intelligent machines without embodiment because you need a real world target against which to measure the, the uh, effectiveness of your communication. Because as you said, I mean, this is where the postmodernists have it right, is that there is a lot of different ways of interpreting everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when your interpretation is good enough? And the answer to that is you agree a priori what would constitute good enough. And when you hit that target, then you're done. All right. Thank you. And I'll look into C.S. Yep. Pierce. Okay. Yep. C.S. Pierce. Yep. Yep. All right. and look then, up the American pragmatists. They American got it right, man. All right. And then, um, so, and then the next one is on transgenderism. And yep. conservatives strongly boast a biological and scientific claim of two genders or two sexes based on what language we're going to use. Um, they believe, and I believe rightfully so, in biological differences between males and females. But I've never heard a liberal argue, and from my perspective, I think I could partially combat this, but it's an argument that hasn't been raised from the liberal side, which I think should have. Um, biological differences in the brain. Women can see more shades of color on average, and men can have better spatial orientation on average. Um, Stephen Pinker's right, there's book. Massive, there's massive neurological and biological differences between yes. men and women. They're well documented, but the, the postmodernist types just assume that the scientists who conducted the investigations are suffering from the same bias that they think permeates everything else, so they just discount it. Yes. So is it is it really crazy to believe that someone could be born with biological similarities to an XY brain and biological X No, no not at all. Not at all. Look, okay. that isn't the argument that I'm making. All right. The argument that I'm making is that uh, gender identity is strongly influenced by biological sex. Okay. And the, the problem is, is that the legislation, especially the legislation that's being introduced in Canada, argues that it's not. 
Yes. And that's just not helpful. It's not even helpful for the transgender types because some of them, for sure, there are people who have mixed biological sex. All you right, know, sure. There are women who have some cells in their body that have male chromosomes. Yes. And then it's not a trivial number, for example. And there are people who are born with genitalia that aren't identifiable, and there are more genuine hermaphroditic types. And there's no different, no doubt that there are some men that have a more feminine personality structure and some women that have a more masculine personality structure and that that's biologically influenced. So I would separate, I'm not making a biological case that there are two genders, the end. Okay, thank you for I'm making, clarifying. I'm making a biological, I'm making a case that sexual identity is unbelievably powerfully influenced by biology with certain exceptions and that those exceptions themselves might be biologically determined, not in all cases, but in many. And so part of the reason I was objecting to legislation like Bill C-16 is because it insists that gender identity is socially constructed. Well, if gender identity is socially constructed, then why can't we just take transgender people and socialize them <laughs> back into their, into their normative sex roles? Exactly. Right, exactly. So that's part of the reason I was objecting to the legislation. Yes. One of the most powerful arguments, and I, I said this, I, I did a presentation in front of the Canadian Senate. I don't know if you saw that or not. And there's no reason for you to have paid attention to it. But if you look up Jordan Peterson and Senate, you'll see that as well, well, along with a professor or along with a practicing lawyer, I made exactly that case to a number of Canadian senators telling them that by supporting this legislation, they were actually doing a disservice to the people that they purported to be helping. So that's, that's, it isn't that biologically there are two sexes, although a pro, as an approximation, that's true. Mm -hmm. As a decent approximation, it's true. It gets slightly messy because there are a multiplicity of ways that sexuality, that sex differences manifest themselves. And there's a fair bit of variability across all of those different manifestations. And so, as I said, you can have feminine man and a masculine male, a masculine woman. That happens very frequently. Um, it's just more often you have a feminine woman and a masculine man. Yes. All right. That perfectly explains my question. And okay. So next, postmodernist thought, and I think you kind of already uh, talked about this um, when you said the American postmodernists got this right and that I'm going to summarize very quickly because you've yeah. already answered, but like, um, you say that you see scientific realism is nested in Darwinian competition. And so it's reasonably objective that the liberal... No, 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 that's not quite right. Okay. No, I, I would say that it isn't obvious to me that there is any truth that, that, is superordinate to, to the truth that's established in a Darwinian fashion. And that includes our notion of, of objective reality. Now, that's where Sam Harris and I had a major disagreement. But yes. again, it has, it's a consequence of, of my pragmatic thinking. You see, the Darwinian claim fundamentally is that the only way that you can come up with a definition of truth is through an, an evolutionary model that uses death as the punishment. Mm -hmm being wrong. And so one of the things I was arguing with, with Sam Harris about is, is whether or not our current conceptualizations of objective truth are necessarily true in a Darwinian sense. And if they're not, which form of truth should take priority? And I was arguing that Darwinian truth should always take priority. And Sam was arguing that, well, well, mm -hmm. he did. He didn't particularly like that stance. Although one of the well, and that's basically how, what our argument, what our argument circulated around. All right. So, so the problem, you see, the problem is, is that we never know. Let's see, what's the problem exactly? Even our objective truth is seriously bounded in ways that we don't understand. Yes. And claim, claim it at, at any given moment as having some sort of fundamental ontological status outside of its Darwinian utility strikes me as dangerous, especially given how transmutable scientific theories tend to be so let's if i'm going to oversimplify things i'm going yeah. to say that liberals tend to think with the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain with future applications <laughs> possibilities likeliness consequences and conservatives you know, that's also the part of the brain that's involved in social cognition eh yes <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. conservatives so that's, that's tend to think with the amygdala yeah. yes so 
Um, here, I'm going to read what I wrote here. Okay. Um, for example, low populations in rural areas would potentially possess more views of self autonomy, working hard, family values, increasing population, protecting oneself and one's kind due to the types of motivations in the hyperthalamus being more applicable to survival. While highly populated areas would focus potentially more on thinking, tolerance, community values, stabilizing population, but additionally might not focus so much on protecting life or raising children. These differences could explain vastly the moral behaviors being ideally or objectively true based on incalculable variables. So oh, you better run you better run run that one through me again. Find me again. It's quite complicated. Yes, it is. So I am suggesting that if we are to look at uh, a reason why how people think yeah. Um, we can look at how people think as being nested in um, Darwinian competition. So, yeah, right. so if if there's a low populated area, um, yeah. you would think, okay, what traits incalculable but some somewhat calculable traits yeah. would be necessary for them to be raised, and what traits mostly in the hyperthalamus, I'm assuming, and what traits would be more applicable for. A large city. So it's almost completely possible that the politics of liberals is perfect for their situation in a big city and the politics of conservatives is... Yeah, it's, good. it's a good hypothesis. It's one that you should think about. Like, it, it's, it is, it isn't, it's, it's a reasonable hypothesis. Now, I'd have to think it through a long time before I, before I, because you're, you're suggesting that a conservative philosophy is more useful in a, in a low populated area. Yes, and I am. Liberal, I, yeah, it's possible. I think I, I don't know. It's worth thinking through. All right, that's because I've been thinking about that a lot. That's my main, the main thing I think about. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying necessarily directly that, but yeah. at least the possibility of that's why. Yeah, well, one thing you could do just to to some degree to begin with is just run a correlation between size of the community and and uh, and political proclivity you should be able to get that data on the line online yep and i mean I, it doesn't it wouldn't be proof because it might be that the more liberal types are also more likely to move to the cities right in yes. which case you'd be leaving conservatives behind and it's not because they're more well adapted well even then it might be because they're more well adapted to smaller communities it's a good idea we i don't know what to make of it but it's it's worth uh, thinking about um and we actually we have that data just through political polls and you'll see yeah, whenever yeah. you look at the map it's all red because the red is in the the smaller areas and the blue looks small because yeah. there's more people there so it does tend to yeah, work yeah. out it's it's look it's it's a plausible hypothesis it might be interesting to look in the red states only and see if it's still true there yes all right so thank you for that it means a lot that yeah. you um Th think of that as a possibility and then have one last question on religion and i've been watching your um your psychological interpretations of the bible as well as i have read yeah. the maps of meaning yeah. um so i may have missed something there um but this question so neurophysiologically to my understanding the way the human brain is constructed is such that Happiness is achieved in the pursuit of a noble aim rather than the attainment of the goal itself. You've talked about this multiple times. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That that you know, I would. It's not even. It's not happiness precisely, but that'll do. It's more like a sense of meaningful engagement, which I think is better than happiness. But that's okay. We can go with happiness for now. All right. So if if there's no noble aim, we are limited to simple pleasures, which do not sustain a positive. Yeah, that's right. You're, that's exactly yes. right. You're limited to impulsive pleasures. Yes, and and those are ones that don't necessarily have a good medium to long term outcome. So if I I am to take a psychological or moral view or moral view of biblical teaching. Um, unlike yeah. a scientific view, um, is am I right in construing that th the idea of external happiness without suffering exists as a brilliantly thought out construct which invokes a sense of purpose and happiness? And if I am to make that conclusion, can I see those concepts in the moral psychology of the Bible as manipulative? Or does the defiance of natural law rule out a literal interpretation? Okay, go back, read that again. So if, I, if I'm to assume all of this with heaven and hell, um, yeah. is it eternal happiness? Yeah. Is that, can you see that as um, manipulative? As like, it doesn't... You can, 
You can. I mean, certainly Marx did, and I would say Freud did as well. One of the problems, because Freud thought of, uh, you know, religion as, let's call it both manipulative and immature, because it guaranteed people the certainty of life after death, and it, it allowed them the comfort of knowing that an all-seeing father was watching over them. Okay, and Freud regarded that, let's say, as immature and man manipulative, but he didn't have a good explanation for why people came up with the idea of hell. Because if you were just going to go for immature and manipulative, it might as well be all positive, right? Why put the negative in there? And you could say skeptically, well, hell is where you put your enemies. But that's a really cynical interpretation because many religious people, and now certainly even, but certainly throughout the Middle Ages, were terrified that hell was something that they were headed to, not that their enemies were going to. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's a reasonable interpretation historically. I know... Marx would say that the, that religion was would do whatever it could to manipulate people so that the power structures, the economic power structures, could stay in place. But um, given that religion, religious structures, and this is, I would say, particularly, but not only true of Christianity, have played a tremendous role in giving additional voice to the people who were downtrodden and enslaved. That that also is a historically that's that's not a historically credible argument. Sometimes that religious teachings are used to buttress the people who are in control, and sometimes they're used to oppose them. So I don't buy that for a second. And then, so no, I don't think the manipulation argument is a, I don't think it's a credible one. I, I mean, I understand it, and I'm an admirer of Freud, you know, but I think he got it wrong. I think he got that wrong. And that was certainly one of the places that he disagreed most profoundly with Carl Jung. And I think Jung came out of it right, and Freud came out of it wrong. Um, and then I think the Marxist critique of religion, it's just like every other Marxist critique. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can treat religious religion, religious structures as if they're oppressive power structures only. But, you know, it, it's just a reduction of a multidimensional complexity to a to a relatively predictable unidimensional uh, unidimensional phenomenon. It's, it's not helpful. It's not a helpful intellectual exercise past its immediate self-evidence. You know, because the self-evidence is some religious people are corrupt. It's like, yeah, right. Obviously. That that's fair. And given the I'm taking I'm taking one concept, um, heaven, way out of context yeah. of a of a huge bundle of things. So that's a yeah, big you know, too. there's a writer named um I should tell you about this guy. Um Jeffrey Burton Russell. Jeffrey Burton Russell. You'd like him. Okay. Yeah, he's written a couple of books on heaven and, and uh, uh, a very good series on the devil as a historian. So he's a historian of the idea of heaven and the idea of the devil. Okay. So he had three volume series on the devil. One is Mephistopheles, which I think is the best one. But if you're interested in 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 that kind of idea, Jeffrey Burton Russell is a good person to to take a look at. He's credible, nice. um, credible historian. And, and I think his books are extremely interesting. So, and he delves into the idea of heaven in a much more fundamental way than, than the typical, especially the typical sort of casually religious critical postmodernist who always assumes that there's nothing to it except power dynamics. It's foolish because heaven at, at minimum is a vision of a better future. Mm -hmm. and even, mm -hmm. even, as, even as only that, it's, it's by no means trivial. I mean... Human beings are about the only creatures that can imagine a better future. And so heaven is like the archetypal better future. Yes. And so you don't want to just demolish that idea too casually because we're always working, unless we're pathological, we're always working for a better future. So, and to think of heaven as the idea that's sort of shining behind that, the, you know, the, the, the platonic ideal of the idea of a better future, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to think. And you don't want to just throw it away. That would be throwing away one of the greatest ideas of mankind. And that doesn't mean I think that people should be politically utopians. It's not the same thing. Yes. It's the it's the concept that, that has the psychological effects on the way people behave. Um, yeah, well, that, well and, yeah, that's right. And it's the concept that's of value. Like, I think the difference between the Christian idea of heaven and the political utopian idea of heaven is that for Christians, heaven is what would be achieved through the use of truth. 
individual truth. And for the political utopian, it would be as a consequence of the instantiation of some particular political system. No, those are not the same thing at all. All right. And then we I have about 10 more minutes by my time. Yep. So uh, you answered those all my questions. questions by the way. They're really good questions. Thank you. Um, I spent a long time thinking which to ask because obviously there's a million questions. You're one of the only people I've had faith in that could answer some of the questions I've had. Yeah, so what do you do? Um, I I like to think of myself as a philosopher, like Socrates. Are you a student? I am a student. I go in and out of school. I tend to make money when I need to doing odd jobs and read yeah. all day. Like, I don't have a lot of value on society. Society is very weird to me. What are your future plans? I want to go into academia. I want to do research. Um, yeah. Well, you're pretty smart, you know. That's a good you. plan. Those are good questions. Um, I, it's School is expensive, and the types of schools that I, I go to are kind of boring. I Like, if I could go yeah. to your class every day, I would be the happiest person ever. <laughs> um, but the, the type of teacher is not that they're not intelligent. They're just not um, a Sam Harris or a Neil deGrasse Tyson or a Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I spent yeah. a lot of time reading reading through Einstein over and over again, reading through, um, or listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I like learning. I just, the university doesn't give me, um, substantial means of learning. I don't feel like I learn much. I yeah, no, I get the picture. I get the picture. It's, it's yeah. Um, if the problem that you've got is that there's some utility in credentials. So, you know, there's always the possibility of going to university for the credentials and educating yourself at the same time. Yes. Which is what you really have to do if you go to university anyways. I know it's a, but, it, you know, it's always an uncomfortable meld between what you want and what should be and what you can get. Yes. Mark Twain says, I never let my uh, schooling interfere with my education. Well, right. <laughs> yes, exactly. That That's perfect. Yes. So that's what I'm doing. I have a couple semesters left. Uh, the problem is, I don't know, I... I have a couple semesters left. I go to the University of Michigan. The problem is my motivation, um, which I've watched a lot of videos on your motivation, I'm, yep. I can't find the motivation to do the work. If I was at Harvard or Princeton or Yale or somewhere where I was like challenged, where I would be like, yep. this is a huge opportunity for me. You have I'm to build the damn challenge in. You've got to build the challenge in for yourself somehow. Have you done the future authoring program? The what program? Future authoring program? Um, I I have done that. Yes. Did it help? I think I was too focused subconsciously with the reasons why it would help. Um, determining why why this would help me. It's helping me because of this. It's helping me because of that. And kind of like playing mind games with myself, making it so it, it, it didn't really help me as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because, you know, the, the fact is, given, given your level of, of, of let's say, intellect, you you would have to have a pretty good goal to to you know it's not atypical for someone to be very smart and very open but not very conscientious and i don't know if you're not very conscientious maybe you are but what you've said so far suggests that you're higher in openness and lower in conscientiousness but what you need to rectify that if you're if you can rectify it is a suitably lofty goal and so mm -hmm. you and but but if you didn't do the future authoring program in a manner that helped you establish that goal, it probably isn't going to help you. Like you obviously need a reason, and fair um, enough, you know. So I guess my goal would to uh, be going to grad school at uh, an Ivy League college. I would yeah, say well, that's, that's my a good goal. goal. Um, and I'll have to. I mean, at one point, I uh, I wrote a letter to like basically everybody that works at the Harvard admissions by finding their, uh, the, uh, the emails and, yep. and like sent, uh, a letter explaining my situation, my family situation, why I didn't get good grades in high school, why I've never been an atypical good student, but I have a large drive and motivation to learn. And I know yep. every single professor at Harvard, and I'm familiar with their work. I've read their abstracts in their uh, in their journals. Not every single one, I'm exaggerating, but I'm very familiar and with Yale too. And wanted to go into linguistics, and yep. I never got a response back. And I kind of just sunk back into my my read and ignore the uh, the universe type of 
thing, but I definitely, you were right, I need to set a goal and not sink back into my behavioral extra central drift, but actually go yeah. towards that goal. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you have a good goal to go to, gra- to a credible graduate school and to pursue an academic career is a good goal, but you also might want to really think hard about what the hell you're going to do if that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you're kind of built for it. So it would be a good pursuit. And, you know, you sound like the kind of guy who could use a PhD. Thank you. So, well, your questions were smart. You know, I had to listen to them hard and you thought about them a lot and they were sophisticated. So, um, you you know, and, and that puts you in the top, I don't know, 1% of students, probably something like that. It's something like that, five, 1 to 5%. And so you've got the right kind of mind for it. And with a mind like that, you really, you also really want to get yourself disciplined because um, it's also safer if you have a mind like yours to get disciplined because the problem with a mind like yours is it'll, 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 uh, you'll be chasing it everywhere like someone with an ill, a badly trained bloodhound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's that. That can be really hard on a person over time, you know, because it's easy to be one of those people that has a tremendous amount of potential but doesn't have it realized and why that's a rough life by the time you're about 40. Yes. I'm also what is uh linguistically defined as a a polymath where academia is one interest that I'm I'm showing you right now because you're an academic but I have a wide variety of um interests like music, art, yeah, um, well, that's your very high in openness. Yes. Eh? That, that's I've, the trait that's under, that I so that it's, That's where my yeah. openness is high. So I do have yeah. other opportunities. You know Childish Gambino, Donald Glover? No. He is a, he's a, a rapper and um, a stand-up comedian, and he's writing Deadpool. He's done... Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. He's very, very... I identify a lot with him, looking at him yeah. as a role model. He does a lot of different things, and... He were, I don't know, his, the profanity in his uh, work makes it, discredits his talent by a lot of people, but like, so did um, Shakespeare. I mean, basically, what the things he says is witty and punny and uh, pro, uh, profane, of course, but so is Shakespeare, you know, for the time. But I identify a lot with him. Well, I, I'm afraid I have to bring our talk to a halt because I, I have someone else who's right up here. But look.